Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to read uh, 1 to 14, but our, we're only going to be looking at uh, today 12 to 14. And is, this is the purpose of Christ's gifts, the purpose of Christ's gifts. We've been looking at unity and the various gifts of the body, and then we're going to look at the purpose. I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity in the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean by that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who ascended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of, of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature and the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And I'll stop there, but he continues. He just elaborates on what sanctification will do. <clears throat> After the general command to walk worthy of our calling in Christ with the injunction to keep the unity of the Spirit, Paul gives re reasons for this unity, and then he turns to the gifts given that are to bring us to growth and unity over time. After noting some of the gifts, Paul now turns to the purpose of the gifts, the exalted Christ gives to the church. In verse 12, verse 12 is a unit with each phrase depending on and flowing from what proceeds. Paul is not saying that only church officers build up the church. Now, I know that you might get that impression because he gives a very limited list of gifts, and he focuses on the critical ones. I mean, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. <clears throat> but it's very clear, as we read in the context, that every Christian receives gifts. Every Christian receives some gift. The co context clearly indicates that all gifts are in view. In addition, Paul does not say that the work of does not say the work of the ministry, but the work of ministry. And there are a number of things to note about these verses, and I'm not going to get into all the there's some complex grammar and stuff. We're going to just skip over that and get to the nitty gritty. First, Christ's gifts are given for equipping the saints. The word equipping, if you have the old King James, perfecting, and that's a fine translation is only found here in the New Testament. In classical Greek, the same word is used for when a ship is old and decrepit, they would bring it into port and they'd completely refit it and refurbish it. And it's also used of doctors setting broken bones. You're taking something that's disordered, that's broken, that's out of shape, that's chaotic, and you're making it good again. The idea is that what sin has done to pollute and corrupt men, both as to knowledge and behavior, the gifts of Christ, which are the gifts given through his spirit, are designed to counteract these effects of sin and the fall over time. So it's a really good word to use. <clears throat> In scripture, the wicked are compared to a chaotic, stormy, filth-filled sea, Isaiah 57. 20 to 21 says, The wicked are like the troubled sea, when they cannot rest, when water is cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So sin brings everything into chaos. Turbulence. Restlessness. And Calvin notes that even though they are not um, agitated by wind or tempest, the wicked carry on mutual war and dash with terrible violence against one another. This is what sin has done to mankind. 
Okay, I know, you know, if you're an atheist and you're an ignorant fool uh, and you think this is just the process of evolution, the survival of the fittest and violence and uh, putting yourself first over others and being selfish and being violent. Uh, if you're an evolutionist, if you're an atheist, well, that would be a good thing. And that's how Hitler interpreted evolution, because it's the survival of the fittest. But that's not the way of the Christian. These are the ways of sin, the flesh, and God is turning that all around in Christ. Men are totally depraved and rotten in all parts of their nature. They love sin and cannot cease from sin. And the throne room of God where the saints are completely free from sin is, as it were, Revelation 15, 2, a sea of glass, perfect peace, perfect tranquility. The restoration will extend even to the creation. And when Jesus returns, there will be a new heavens and a new earth where perfection and glorification is achieved. <clears throat> So that's what Jesus does. That's the purpose of these gifts. They're accomplishing what Christ set by his perfect work of redemption. Paul is speaking, of course, about corporate sanctification. <clears throat> now, the translation perfecting has been abused by perfectionists. The passage does not mean that we can become perfect in this life but rather that we are progressively restored to what God intended man to be through the gifts from Christ. And I, I like what John Gill says here. Though there is a complete perfection in Christ, yet not in themselves, their sanctification is imperfect, as their faith, knowledge, love, etc. Sin is in them and committed by them. And they completely want or need supplies of grace. And the best of them are sensible of their imperfection and own it. And if you ever read what Calvin says about himself, or people like Jonathan Edwards, uh, extremely humble, noting that how unworthy they were. Christ justifies sinners through a sacrificial death and sinless life. And he sanctifies them or heal, heals them spiritually. And this is a process in which the believer must act or participate. In justification, you simply lay hold of what Christ achieved by the, by the instrument of faith. And faith itself is a gift. In sanctification, yes, you have the Holy Spirit. And yes, the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to uh, sanctify your heart. It so you can understand the Word of God and applies it to your heart. But you're required to act. This point is obvious when we consider those things that are commonly associated with the means of grace. Preaching, listening to sermons, teaching, the observance of the sacraments, Bible reading, prayer. The purpose of the gifts to every Christian is to render service to each other and to the church as a whole. There is to be a body life where ministry is rendered by the entire flock to the flock. For Paul, writing under divine inspiration, the priesthood of all believers is real and practical. It, is, it serves an important function. There is an important function for every Christian, no matter how feeble he or she may seem. Okay, so if you're studying theology a lot, you should, hopefully you are, you could put that to use. You want to put that to use. Church membership and attendance is supposed to be more than going to church to hear the pastor preach a sermon. There must be a seeking of fellowship, helpful communications, wholehearted participation, mutual edification. There should be much more of an attitude, what can I do to help the church? What can I do to help the church? Rather than, what's in it for me? A what's in it for me attitude. I've done a lot of knocking on doors in the past and, and, and evangelism. And the way Americans look at church is, tell me about your programs. They look at it like a country club. You know, country club, do you have tennis courts? Do you have a golf course? Oh, well, people, oh, well, tell me about your youth groups. Tell me about the programs. You got a good band? You got a good worship leader? Do you got, do you got a lot of good entertainment? Et cetera, et cetera. They don't, you know, the questions that they should be asking, do they have really good, solid, exegetical, theological preaching? 
where the guy really goes through the scriptures and tells you what it means and what's the theology there and the applications. They don't ask those kind of questions because Americans don't think theologically. There must be more meditation by the leaders in the whole church on how people with different gifts and abilities can be engaged in ministry, where they're helping the elderly and widows, comforting the sick, engaging in various forms of evangelism, having a campus ministry, helping Christian candidates for office, if there are Christian candidates for office. Obviously, it is the church leaders who take the lead in training, organizing, and equipping believers for ministry. But we must get away from the idea that the pastor and elders do everything while the members are mere spectators. In fact, it's even worse than that today because the elders don't, generally don't do anything either. Now, in some Reformed churches, they do, you know, especially in Reformed Baptist churches, they do. Uh, they help with visitation. They help with counseling. But the Presbyterian churches that I've been associated with in the past where I've been members, uh, most of the elders had no idea about theology. They didn't know how to counsel. And they just, you know, hey, Bob, you're a good businessman. You go to church every week. You tithe. Do you want to be an elder? Oh, okay. You're an elder now. And then he becomes an elder. And then when there's a serious counseling situation, they don't know what to do. They don't, they don't know theology. They can't teach. They don't know how to counsel. So everybody needs to work on their gifts. And elders, of course, should be able to teach. And I realize how busy everyone can be. I'm, I'm ridiculously busy. And I know that time is limited. You know, I got, I got adult children. They're going to college, working, doing different things. It's very, they're very busy. Nevertheless, if everyone did a little and things were organized and done intelligently, then much good progress in edification would be the result. We can get a campus ministry going. We don't have to do it every week. We can do it like once every couple of months. You know, set the original, set the goals low and, and be faithful. Start low. Be faithful. Redeem the time. I know of situations where pastors are so busy doing all sorts of things that, uh, besides preaching, which by far is their most important job, um, their preaching suffered greatly because they're busy doing all sorts of goofy things that could be done by other people. And I know of one pastor on the East Coast as many years ago, and he just didn't know how to say no to people. He did not know how to say no, and he got so busy and so... Uh, overworked trying to get his sermons done and, and do all this stuff he just got out of the ministry he couldn't take it well that's not good the people got to pick up the slack and help the modern idea of a pastor among many evangelicals is more than uh, is more that of a business manager or a club leader than a convicting effective teacher and exhorter unfortunately calvin speaking of paul's teaching in verse 12 and which we're going to talk about in just a second says, Paul could not exalt more highly the ministry of the word than by attributing to it this effect. For what higher work can there be than to build up the church that it may reach its perfection? They therefore are insane, who neglecting this means hope to be perfect in Christ, as is the case with fanatics, who pretend to secret revelations of the Spirit, and the proud who content themselves with a private reading of the scriptures and imagine they do not need the ministry of the church. End of quote. If Christ is appointed the ministry for edification of his body, it is vain to expect that end to be accomplished in any other way. That's Calvin. I don't know how I got a second quote in there. Now you read Calvin, I've got uh, his sermons on Ephesians, and you read Calvin, and he'll, you'll read one page and it sounds like he, he only thinks this passage applies to the teaching ministry. But then you'll read two pages down and he, he'll make sure, yeah, this applies to all Christians, so you've got to be careful. <clears throat> the preached word is the God-ordained method for the spread of the gospel and the central way that edification occurs in the church. God's word defines ethics, worship, government, and the sacraments. Everything is defined and articulated in the Word of God. Everything. 
Every aspect of ministry that occurs in the body is informed and directed by Scripture. So we never want to forget that. We don't believe in parachurch organizations. We don't believe in parachurch ministries. Ministries got to be connected with the church. Thus, we see the importance of preaching or teaching. The modern de-emphasis on solid exegetical preaching, which, which is common in evangelical churches and sad to say common in reformed churches, I know a lot of, I, I know people, they, you know, they visited churches, and the, the, the guy preaches a little ditty for about 20 minutes. <laughs> Car just drove by with an Easter bunny, waving to all the kids. Yeah, if you're celebrating Easter today, Easter is the Anglicized form of the word Ashtart, which is a, a fertility cult from the Middle East. And it totally is dishonoring to Christ, and Christ hates Easter. We celebrate the resurrection of Christ every single week. The modern de-emphasis on solid evangelical preaching in favor of uh, psychology, pep talks. Has rendered evangelicals impotent. Impotent. The forsaking of God's law for pragmatism and legalism has rendered the church impotent. The evangelicals, their divorce rate's the same as the general population. But don't get caught smoking a cigar or having a beer. The neglect of applicatory preaching for little Bible lessons for children has rendered the church weak and immature. Yes, evangelicals can pull them in with entertainment. And the worst preachers in the most terrible churches tend to have the biggest churches. It's sad, but it's true. Rock and roll and jokes, pull them in. But are they really being edified in the manner that Paul intends? Evangelicals, for the most part, are not dependable on doctrine or worship or sanctification. And for generations, Reformed churches have been moving in that direction. I was in the OPC in the 70s when uh, a church in Jenkin, I think it's Jenkintown, Pennsylvania, north of Philadelphia, Dr. Miller, great guy, godly man, he was totally fought against Norman Shepherd tooth and nail, but on worship he was horrible. And they, they started the, you know, the, the banjos and all the rock and roll and the, the, the charismatic dancing and all that. They did that, and that was considered shocking and offensive to people in the OPC. And eventually, I think he left and joined the PCA. But that, that kind of worship, now that's common in the OPC. That's common. I've been in OPC churches where they didn't even use a hymnal. They, they did the overhead projector, like a charismatic church, and they sang little campfire ditties. Of course... Even, even the hymnal's bad because God wants us to sing inspired songs only. Second, Paul says that the training, equipping, perfecting, or restoring of believers is to edify for the edifying of the body of Christ. This is obviously closely related to what precedes. Edifying refers to spiritual growth, to a building up. Building up refers to the nature and goal of Christian ministry. The way of sin of the flesh is a, a tearing down. It's destructive. And the more you go to areas where sin is practiced in a habitual way, the greater the crime rate, the more dangerous it is, the more chaotic it is. Go to the ghetto. Ghettos aren't hell holes because of racism. Ghettos are hell holes because there's no father in the home and... and they're not taught biblical ethics. It is the spiritual descent into slavery, to sin, and the power of darkness. It makes us think of rude, mockery, insults, lies, gossip, backbiting, lewd speech, and the like. But edifying makes us think of words that build up. And the context certainly talks about that uh, after verse 14, but speaking the truth in love. He's talking to all Christians. Don't do this, do that. Speak the truth in love. Don't gossip. Don't be a jerk. Speak the truth in love. If you really care about somebody and love them, you're going to help them. The conveying of crucial biblical truths, the use of love and correction based on Scripture, the use of biblical and compassionate communication with the goal of correction and spiritual progress. 
When Christians gossip or blow up in anger or give the silent treatment in anger or refuse to communicate the truth and love out of fear of being disliked, they're not being faithful to our passage, are they? They're acting like the world. And of course, gossip is prevalent today in churches, very prevalent. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 10, 8, says that Jesus gave the apostles their gifts and their authority for edification and not for destruction. Consequently, the modern idea of ministry as a pragmatic practice full of compromise and toleration of errors is obviously contrary to Scripture. It is humanism or neoliberalism masquerading as piety and love. And here's what Calvin says, and it's really quite good. Quote, And at the same time, on the other side, let us each look well to himself, for we shall give account of the benefits that God has bestowed upon us. And the more a man is received, the more blamed he will be. If he does not endeavor to discharge his duty in serving his neighbors, as I said before. For the invariable object of all God's gifts is to edify one another. That God's temple may grow among us and be reared until it reaches its full perfection. And so you see how we ought to employ the spiritual gifts that we have received from God. For the same reason, it also said that such as know the gospel ought to show by the conduct of their whole life that they are the children of light and not like blind wretches that wander in darkness. Wherefore, let us learn to make God's gifts serviceable in such a way that he may be glorified in them. In that respect, mention is expressly made of measure, in order that we should not plead this or that, that that man sets us no good example. For when it is a question of commendation, then every one of us makes himself uh, believe, and would persuade all the world to believe that he is most excellent. And yet, in the meanwhile, we do not consider that God has doubly bound us to him, in vouchchasing to show such large bountifulness to us that he has set us in a higher state than our neighbors. Therefore, let us give better consideration to what we have done, both generally and particularly. Generally, because we have the gospel freely preached here among us, and because we ought elsewhere to be like a burning lamp to show the way of salvation. And particularly, by every man discharging his own duty so that we give no cause of offense to our neighbors, but rather endeavor to draw us, to us, those who are estranged from God and his truth, let us also take pains to establish and convince those whom God has already caused to set out well. And in the right way, but alas, men perform this duty badly. For when any man has excellent gifts, he will insist on lording it over others and being, as it were, worshipped as an idol. And so, as for unity, it is broken almost entirely. And yet for all that, as I said before, it is impossible for us to join together in brotherly concord except by submitting ourselves to such as are of the church and for, to our, as to our own members. Without that, it is impossible for us to truly be joined in one. For you see that every man covets to be held in esteem. Again, when it is a question of edifying of others, we act clean contrary to what Paul tells us here. For in the 14th and 50 chapters of Romans, he shows us that we must behave as a strong man should see another man weak. So little ought he to display his strength to the bruises of his neighbor that he ought rather to bear him up. Who would say that if I had a little child to lead, I should break both his arms and legs and running hastily with him? And if another man who is much stronger than I would want to tire me under the pretext that he is lustier than I by, tr by trying his ability and strength against me, it is right that I should be cast down by him. Therefore, we must, as I said, have a care to fashion ourselves in such a way to our brethren that the stronger do not press upon our neighbors who are feeble and weak, nor vex them by laboring to overcome them by force. Let us not behave as did some when the prophet Ezekiel rebukes, namely those such as abuse their energy and strength like goats that jostle with their horns against the little lambs, which have no intention but to be meek. Ezekiel 34, 21. That is what we ought to do, and from which we are far off, end of quote. And Calvin goes on to this excellent thing where he deals with a problem in the church there and talks about it and rebukes people right in this sermon. It's really quite good. And then third, in verse 13, Paul returns to this main theme of unity begun back in verse three, verses 3 and 5. The equipping or training of the saints and the progressive edifying of the body of Christ proceeds, and this is verse 13, till we all come to the unity of, of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the 
fullness of Christ. So the gifts of the church are given by Christ in order to achieve a spiritual and doctrinal unity. The unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God clearly have an intellectual or doctrinal emphasis. And of course we know that from the context where verse 14 Paul will say, don't be tossed, you don't want to be like an immature little baby who's tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Christians are not simply to learn a few basics or fundamentals of the faith and then leave the great body of doctrine given to us in, uh, in, in ignorance so we can focus on entertainment and having a lot of fun. We must be striving for a full-grown manhood in faith and a full knowledge of Christ so that we are not immature, unknowledgeable, undependable, inexperienced little children. So that's spoken directly to you. That is your responsibility. For Paul, piety and unity can never be divorced from doctrine and Christian knowledge. This false dichotomy, this false antithesis between uh, doctrine and practicality or, or, or faith and life that we see among evangelicals and Reformed churches too. I've seen it in Reformed churches. It's, it's, it's sheer nonsense. It's sure nonsense. The terms faith and knowledge are held together so that Paul is not speaking about a mere intellectual knowledge without belief. Obviously, knowledge without faith is worthless. There are liberal theologians who own a lot of doctrine, but it doesn't do them any good at all because they don't believe in it. Thus, they hold all sorts of heresies and gross immoralities. Paul's teaching assumes that a true knowledge of scriptural teaching believed by Christians, will sanctify them, cause them to grow in maturity and in unity. That Paul's focus is on the Christian faith as an inspired body of doctrine and knowledge attained over time is made crystal clear by verse 14. Let me just read it. I mentioned this earlier, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of of deceitful plotting. There is to be a oneness belonging to the faith and to the knowledge of Christ. The goal of ministry is to increase in the unity of the faith and, of course, regarding our knowledge of Christ. The knowledge of Christ is noted for he is the object of our faith and the whole system of doctrine in the scriptures, the Bible, is focused on the centrality of the person and work of Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, he's the focus. And one cannot have a proper true faith in Christ without a true knowledge of the Trinity, the two natures, the human and divine of Jesus, the atonement, the resurrection, the mediation of Christ, the justification by faith, etc., etc., etc. We go on and on. Everything is related to Christ and his perfect work of redemption. That's why cults and modern Judaism, which is nothing but Phariseeism, can never understand Scripture properly. Because if you don't know Christ, you can't understand Scripture. If you don't know Christ, you can't have true theology. You can't understand theology. Perfect unity will not be attained among believers this side of heaven, obviously. Let me see. Here's what Calvin says. It's really quite funny. Um, you see here. You see that that our Lord Jesus is the very mark at which we aim. If a man were to shoot with a longbow, or with a crossbow, or with a firearm, and have no target before him, but were to shoot haphazardly, this way or that, without shooting, what shooting would that be? Even so stands the case with all them that do not aim at our Lord Jesus Christ. It's actually tragic. It's sad. You see these people, they go to India, and they're, they're searching for, they claim they're searching for the truth. They go into drugs and mysticism and the occult and they go to India and, and this and they go to that. And it's, it's all vanity. It's all, it's all shooting at the wind. You have to shoot at Christ. Now we know that perfect unity cannot be attained this side of heaven. But this fact does not eliminate 
a true real unity as the goal of spiritual gifts. It's still the goal. It's still what we should strive for. It is as wrong to say we can never have perfect unity so we should not even try as to say that we can never attain perfect sanctification in this life so should we, not, we should not even try. Our goal is to obey the law exhaustively in thought, word, and deed. That's our goal. That's what we should be striving for. And we should be striving for perfect unity, even though we know that both will not be attained the side of heaven. The post-apostolic church attempted a true unity, and the early ecumenical councils made great progress toward unity with biblical, precise theological statements. And we still they're still beautiful in use today. The Nicene Creed. The Apostles' Creed, these, these wonderful statements that define the Trinity, define the two natures in Christ, and so forth. They're great. Of course, things really deteriorated after Augustine, and the great progress would have to wait, await the Reformation. The Reform side of the Reformation, now the Lutherans made progress in justification in certain things, but they were horrible on the sacraments and horrible on worship. But the Reform side of the Reformation made great progress and put their achievements in writing. The First and Second Helvetic Confessions, Dort, the Belgian Confession, the Westminster Standards, the Heidelberg Catechism, etc., the Presbyterians in Scotland, of course, surpassed the Dutch and the German Reformed, who retained the Romanist use of instruments and extra-biblical holy days. The three and a half centuries following, however, have been seen steady decline in the vast majority of Reformed circles. With doctrinal pluralism and great diversity in worship based on human invention, we must recognize declension, decline, a deep corrosion, and return to the biblical goal that Paul sets before us of real, biblically defined unity. Now, what's the first step of repentance? Well, the first step of repentance is to recognize your sin problem or your doctrinal problem. You have to recognize it. You have to admit it. And that's not happening today. People are defending their corruptions in worship. People are defending their corrupt doctrines. You have to acknowledge it. You have to have illuminated mind and acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge the disobedience. Then there must be a turning away from the acceptance of loose subscriptionism and doctrinal pluralism. pluralism. There must be repentance. You turn from your error and your sin. We cannot emphasize enough just how unbiblical and insidious modern concepts of unity are. And they're just accepted by people today. They've been so long professed and accepted by churches that people don't even question this. They just accept it as true. For Paul, unity is achieved by unity of doctrine, unity of belief, unity of practice. For the modern Christian, unity is based on accepting diversity of doctrines and practices. It's a radical difference. Yes, there, uh, they may say, well, there's some fundamentals that we are uh, generally required, such as the Trinity, the divinity of Christ, biblical inspiration, but the doctrines of creation, the moral law, and even justification by faith alone are now up for grabs. Oh, you've got a few fundamentals. I mean, we used to say they're never going to deny justification by faith alone in reform circles, and, and sure enough, they did. I never thought you would see sacramentalism rearing its head, and it's, it's, it's reared its head. And it's accepted. Doctrinal pluralism says, yeah, you can have, you can have that. You can have paid a communion. Yeah, you can have sacramentalism. Worship, a critical teaching that John Calvin called the pillar of the church next to the doctrine of salvation, is currently a complete humanistic uh, chaos, except for a few small Presbyterian bodies. Does Paul teach that unity can be achieved by accepting disunity under some organizational umbrella? You know, the so-called large tent? And, of course, 
uh, their version of unity is not defined by scripture, it's just simply made up by men, which is prelacy. Does the apostle say that unity is based on compromise with theirs, declension and heresy and will worship? Does Paul teach that we only need to hold a few things and everything else can be twisted and perverted as we please? You want to hold that the early chapters of Genesis are just poetic metaphor? Go ahead. And of course, we know that Genesis is a crucial doctrine. If the reformers in first three generations of Presbyterians thought like modern Presbyterians, there would have been no thorough reformation. There would have been no covenants. There would have been no Westminster standards. You know, they might have a thing, you know, uh, these are the four things God wants you to know. I mean, go back, re get the uh, Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland edition of the Westminster Standards and read the covenant. Read the covenants. Read the whole thing. We've gone, things have gone way back from that. Today, virtually, everyone talks about how great the Puritans and the early Presbyterians were. There are conferences for years and years, for generations, conferences on how great the Puritans are. There are books published about such great men. But if people were honest, would they not admit that today the Puritans would not be welcome in their midst, for they are far too strict and dogmatic? Isn't that true? I have a friend who was on the so-called Puritan board on the Internet, and they criticized the Federal Vision, and I think they criticized the OPC response to it, and they were kicked off the Puritan board. And people who talked about purity of worship were kicked off the Puritan board for advocating pur Puritan concepts of worship. It's like the Pharisees, you know, they whitewashed the tombs of the prophets and talk about how great the prophets were, but they would have killed the prophets if they were alive. The Puritans would be horrified by loose subscriptionism, the widespread will worship and acceptance of Roman Catholic practices, such as the use of organs and instruments and and uh, holy days. They would tear their garments when they saw the Christmas celebrations and parties, now almost universally practiced. The original Puritans Presbyterians would not be uh, hired by any seminary in the United States. Not one. There's not one seminary in the whole United States that would hire a real Puritan. I'm serious. Because the Puritans would rebuke the declension, and they wouldn't cooperate with it. George Gillespie, Samuel Rutherford, and the original Puritans, if you were celebrating Christmas, you'd be under discipline. If you were a minister, you'd be defrocked if you didn't repent. So Joel Beakey Seminary is not a Puritan seminary, is it? He wouldn't last five minutes in a real Puritan denomination. As good as he is, he actually publishes a lot of great stuff. Don't get me wrong, I like Joel Beakey, but let's be honest. There's no neutrality. A false view, view of unity will persecute and shun the true view. It's true. Paul emphasizes and expounds on his point by saying, to a perfect man. Now in this context, perfect man means a man full grown or mature. A full spiritual maturity. That's your goal. It's not simply the goal for elders or pastors or deacons or whatever. It's the goal of every Christian to be mature. The goal is for all Christians to be solid. There is to be a growth in gifts, graces, holiness, free from the childless infirmities that come from the sinful flesh, habituated to sin by ungodly thinking and habits. We will never be the perfect man until the second coming, obviously, when there is a perfect world. But our goal remains the same. You know, I've been around a long time, and I've seen all kinds of people. I've done all sides of counseling. And this person will have a problem, and I'll say, well, here, you really need to study these books. And you really need to learn solid what's in these books, because they deal specifically with your problem. Now, you know, I don't deny them counseling, but I say, you know, I like to get people to read something that deals with it. And pff, generally, people just don't read it. They don't learn. They don't, they're not willing to study Doctrinal maturity and maturity of sanctification or practice always go hand in hand. They always go hand in hand. You have to study. You have to see good preaching. 
The standard of perfection is conformity to Christ and conformity to all that Jesus has commanded, including the whole moral law and thought, word, and deed. And then fourth, in verse 14. Paul explains what being mature in the faith will lead to in our lives. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Christian you know, children are often very ign ignorant of things. And they certainly don't have what we call street smarts. They're ignorant of things. They're ignorant in experience. They're easily deceived by clever persons. They're easily swayed from one opinion or doctrine to another. All of us start out as babies in the faith. But we are to desire the pure milk of the word to grow and grow until we are mature doctrinally and ethically. If we do not, then we leave ourselves in great danger and contribute to the disunity of the church. See, you're personally responsible, not just the churchmen, not just the elders or pastors. You're personally responsible for the unity of the church. You're personally responsible to exercise your gifts. You're personally responsible to grow in grace and maturity. The reason that so much heresy and corruption exists today among evangelicals and to a certain extent among Reformed churches is that modern Christians do not give priority to doctrinal heavy preaching and they don't give priority to learning doctrine. I would give out sermons of mine and, uh, to evangelicals and their response would be, why do you have all this detail? Why do you talk about a verse for one whole hour? I mean, come on. They, they thought it was weird. They thought, you know, what's the deal with the doctrine? They, it shows they don't know their Bible. The study of the law is also now almost extinct or non-existent, and that the whole Old Testament has been uh, thrown out or relegated to a former dispensation. Cults and heretics thrive in a sea of ignorance and immaturity. What does a cult person do when they encounter a mature Christian? They turn and they run the other way, almost always. They may debate Jehovah's Witnesses. I start talking to them, and within two minutes, they're usually gone. Gordon Clark used to get out the Greek New Testament, <laughs> and that would really get him. <laughs> uh, and I remember when I was a salesman, I was going door-to-door -door as a salesman back in the 70s, and I, uh, I actually talked to Mormons. And I talked to Jehovah's Witnesses, and I would ask them, you know, you know what, what kind of people do, you know, what kind of people do you really like? And uh, they, their favorite would be Roman Catholics and Protestant liberals, because they didn't know anything, and they were easily twisted, manipulated. But evangelicals aren't far behind. Evangelicals don't know doctrine. Now some do, obviously. There's, you know, there's your John MacArthur. He, he actually makes an effort in his preaching and. You know, his preaching is quite doctrinal. I, mean, I disagree with him, obviously, on certain things. But he makes an effort. But a lot of preaching is not doctrinal at all. Do you study the Bible in a regular, systematic manner? Do you study theology, good, solid, reform stuff, on a regular basis? I'm not saying you should study hours every day. Set aside 30 minutes if you have to, if you're busy. Do you listen to solid theological applicatory sermons? Or do you listen to lightweight fluff? Most people today do not go to church for the preaching. They don't care about the preaching. It's a social club. It's more like a club. I want you to think about this. The Federal Vision Heresy came, 2002, spread like wildfire in the churches. Spread like wildfire. Could that have happened? If Christians knew their doctrine, no. And you're all, I brought this up before, but in the 1600s, uh, Archbishop Laud was trying to incorporate Scotland into prelacy in the, the Episcopal Church, the state church, and he sent 
uh, Episcopal apologists throughout Scotland. And they made no headway whatsoever. And they returned and they told Archbishop Love, they said, look, we talked to these farmers and these peasants and they, they can refute everything we say. They refute everything we say because they applied themselves. So we need to obey Paul on this topic. The people aren't obeying Paul. The world is full of very wicked and ungodly men who set themselves to seduce and deceive others into false doctrines and corrupt practices. It's everywhere. Paul describes them as base men who use a great deal of trickery or cunning. They speak with equivocations and double talk. And if you study, this would be a great topic for a book for somebody. But if you look at the trial, of, you look at Arius, uh, you look at... Uh, Pelagius, you look at the Federal Vision. These people, they use double talk, they use equivocations. When the Federal Vision broke, you know, it's hard, it was hard for people to get a handle on it because these guys were so deceitful and so trickery. That one minute, you know, we're upholding the Westminster Standards, we're teaching the true Reformed faith, and then they would deny it the very next page. You, you have to be aware they're, they're, they're wicked, they're cunning. Are you mature enough to identify them and refute them? This is important. There are false teachers right now in the OPC and the PCA who deny justification by faith alone. There are false teachers right now in the OPC and the PCA who deny the biblical doctrine of creation. There are false teachers at Geneva College, an institution of the Reformed Presbyterian Church in North America, that teach false views of salvation, that teach false views of creationism. In fact, the six-day creationism is mocked. It's laughed at. At least it was last time I was there. Sanctification is dependent on growth in biblical knowledge, both doctrinal and ethical. Obviously, you have to practice it all. You have to believe it. And you have to put it into practice, obviously. So get to work and obey Paul. Get to work and obey Paul. Slothfulness and not redeeming the time needs to be part, uh, needs to be a thing of the past. We need to be more careful about our use of time. You don't have to read a 100-page book every day. You don't have to read for hours every day. Set aside a half an hour. Set aside an hour. But do it every day. You know, I do counseling with people, and I notice that people that are not willing to study, people that are not willing to really apply themselves and memorize passages and memorize things and learn things that they need to learn, they commit the same stupid mistakes and the same sins over and over and over again. You've got to learn it. You've got to put it into practice and tell it what Jay Adams talks about being rehabituated. You think in the correct way automatically because you've done it over and over and you do the right thing automatically because you've done it over and over and that's the process of sanctification. It's crucial. And we'll learn that as we continue in, in, in chapter 4 where Paul, you know, this whole thing that he started on unity goes into a great flourish on how to be sanctified. We'll look at that, Lord willing, next week. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for Paul's teaching. It's amazing. It's amazing. We need it. Apply it to our hearts. Ingrain it into our minds. Don't let us be deceived by what's being currently taught, this false ecumenicalism, this false concept of unity based on the acceptance of disunity, the acceptance of pluralism, the acceptance of doctrinal diversity. Don't let us be fooled by such nonsense. Help us to be godly in our own lives and forgive us for our many faults and sins. In Jesus' name, amen.